war, politics, social unrest, economic uncertainty, international conflicts, climate change. What is the significance of these current events? Where are we heading? Pastor Gary Webster shares answers from the Bible, giving you hope and certainty in the times ahead. Welcome to Countdown Back to the Future. This episode is entitled Global Economic Meltdown The Keys to Financial Security. All right, the keys to financial security. Remember, how could you forget? We've been looking at this many times. These three powers enforce uh, the mark of the beast and therefore global worship via economics in the end of time. You remember the Bible says no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the beast. And then we saw if you take the mark of the beast, you worship the beast. If you worship the beast, you worship Satan. Now, Babylon, the great prostitute, which consists of those three powers. That's what the Bible calls them. We saw last time. These three powers coerce people via economics to take the mark of the beast. And as a result, the fallout is a great global crash. Would you believe it? What goes around comes around. They force people into the economic through economics to do what they want, worship for the devil, now it backfires. Alas, alas, that great city, Babylon, the mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants, that's the financiers of the world, the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. For in one hour such great riches come to nothing. Wow, you can see there a global economic meltdown is predicted in the Bible. The question we want to answer this evening in a very serious way is how can we survive? How is it possible to survive what's going to take place on the world in a number of fronts and ultimately on this front? I want to talk about the keys to financial security. God's secret for providing for his children not just in the final crisis, but every day. In fact, you'll only survive the final crisis if we learn the principles today. The first one is trust God. Rest in his care, the Bible says. Notice what Jesus said. Then he said to his disciples, therefore I say to you, do not worry. But oh, how we worry, don't we? We worry about many things. He said, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Consider the ravens, consider the birds, in other words, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn. And God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? Now, put your name in there. And I put my name in there. You and I are of far more value than the birds. And if God is going to look after them and does, won't he do that? If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven because we get the wheat and we cook it, how much more will he clothe you and me? Oh, you of little faith. Your father knows what, that you need these things. Isn't that a precious thought, my friends, tonight? The first thing God says to us is we need to stop worrying and throw things on God because he cares about us. He really does. I love the way Peter put it, casting all your care upon him. What worries are you carrying tonight? Is it your kids? Is it your job? Is it your health? The Bible says, cast all your care upon him for he cares for you. I don't know about you tonight, but that is amazing and it's worth everything. The Lord cares for you personally. Number two, make God your first priority. Notice what Jesus went on to say. 
but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, the food, the clothes, the roof over your head, all these things shall be added to you. Now, Jesus knew what he was talking about because he often lived and slept under the stars because he never had a home, but God looked after him. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it, when you think about it? Jesus borrowed donkeys, borrowed boats, and God looked after him. But seek first the kingdom of God. But it's so easy for you and I to put it second or third or fourth. We're so busy with our program. We're so busy doing many things that we can put God second. And we set ourselves up for failure when we don't seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and the promise is all these things shall be added to you. Number three, remember that God owns everything. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. In fact, the psalmist put it this way. For every beast of the forest is mine, says God, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. Now, when you think of that, that means you and I don't own anything. Not a brass razoo, as we say. <laughs> it all belongs to God. He owns it twice, actually. First by creation and second by redemption. Because Jesus paid on the cross for everything. So that means we are God's managers because we're not owners. So we are managers. Remember that the Bible says, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. What's a steward? Well, according to the concise Oxford Dictionary, it's a person who's entrusted with the management of another's property. And we just learned that everything is owned by God. So now he makes us managers of what he puts in our hands so that is what you and I and that's all we are we are not owners we are managers of a number of things the gift of life that's life is sacred it comes from God it's a gift from God so treasure it guard it that's why we talk one evening about your body my body is the temple of the living God it's a it's a precious privilege to have God living in us the gift of life he puts in our hand the gift of time. Time is a precious talent. With time, we can bless others. With time, we can bring honor to God by what we do for others. And, and that says something about God. Time is so precious. Tragic when people fritter away moments that they could be used to help in many other ways. We are managers of the talents or the abilities and the gifts that God gives. You know, there's so many abilities. We're going to hear from Gira. I hope I get pronounced your name right. I probably butchered that. Gira's from Venezuela. She's going to sing at the beginning of our second session. Some people can do that. Other people have artistic talents in terms of art and decorations and floral and gardens and there's just an abundance of different gifts that people have got and we all got gifts but they have been used to the glory and the honor of God in the way we use them by helping other people and blessing others through them also the money that God provides is is a, is a gift from God and we are to use it to his honor and glory you know we're all very wealthy here tonight you say, man, I don't have too many dollar notes. But let me tell you, I've been to some places where you are rich. Go to India, go to Delhi, train station. That's kitchen, that's bedroom. They live on the train station, families. Man, we are so wealthy down under compared to many. So the money God provides. God says here, you shall remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you power to get wealth. So in other words, even the ability to get money comes from God. And God says, remember. So how do we remember? 
that point that God said to remember. Remember that the Lord your God is he who gives you the power. I'm going to talk about something fascinating tonight. I want to talk about the birthright. I'm going to talk about this. Jacob. Jacob and Esau were the sons of Isaac. Now, back in the ancient times, what we call the patriarchal period, the father was the head of the clan. And the clan needed looking after. They owned sheep. They grew crops and so on. And the father, when he died, he would make his firstborn son the heir. Now, the heir would get a double portion of the goods. It was shared among the others as well. But he would also be what we could call the priest of the home, if you like, or the priest of the clan, the leader, the spiritual head of the clan. OK, so the birthright meant that the person who got it, he got a double portion. He was the leader of the clan now, and he was also the spiritual head of the clan to try to help the clan to stay close to God. That was their responsibility. Now, Isaac and Rebecca have two boys. Uh, uh, Esau and Jacob and they're twins and Esau happens to come out first so he's the older one and uh, Esau was uh, a man for the moment he lived for this world he did not care about God the Bible says he despised the birthright he wanted the stuff and he wanted to be the leader but he didn't want the spiritual thing you met people like that it's tragic like that car we talked about the other night that, that's supposed to have four wheels and it tries to run on two or three. Leave the spiritual bit out. Well, Esau was like that. Anyway, in this family, the dad favoured the older boy Esau because, you know, he was a hunter and he was sort of a he-man and, and, he, and he made good stew from his, from his catches. And so the dad liked him. The mum favoured the younger one. And that's uh, Jacob because he was more domestic and looked after the sheep and the things around the house more and the home more. So she favoured him. But she also knew that this young fellow was the one actually that God had chosen. Because God had told her at the time of the birth what was going to happen. Anyway, she tried to persuade her husband that, you know, he, he should give the birthright actually to the younger one. But he wouldn't have anything of it. And so the day came when the dad, he knew he was going to die. By this time, Isaac is as blind as a bat. He can't see anything, hardly. And he, he knew that his wife favoured the younger son. So he decided to do the birthright blessing secretly. He called his young boy, his oldest boy to him and says, my boy Esau, he said, I'm going to give you the birthright blessing. And he, he didn't want his wife to know about this. But she heard what he'd said. Can't hide behind the four walls. You can listen through a tent, can't you? <laughs> she heard what he said. And so the father said, you go out and get a, uh, a deer, kill it, cook up some stew, come up back and we'll have this birthright blessing meal and then I'll put the blessing on you. So mum, when she heard this, she says to the younger boy, she says, hey boy, she says, come here. I'll tell you what to do. Your dad is about to give the birthright blessing to your older brother and he'll be the head of everything. And I know you want to be the spiritual head, especially because that's what Jacob craved. He, he, he liked the spiritual things, especially. She said, this is what we're going to do. You go and get a goat out of the paddock and uh, bring it here. And you kill it and I'll cook up a meal for you. And then you go in to your father and you say, I'm Esau. See what's happening in this family. It's a family. A bit of deception going on here. And he says, hang on, mum, hang on, just woo here a bit. I don't sound like Esau for starters. And secondly, he's very hairy and I don't have any hair on me hardly at all. So dad's going to feel me. He's going to hear my voice. And he's, instead of blessing me, he'll curse me. She says, never mind. Mum knows what mum's doing, like moms do. And she said, you just do what I tell you to do. So he went and got the deer, killed it. The, the, the goat killed it, brings it to his mum. And she gets some of the skins and she ties them on his arms so that they're all furry on the back of his neck. And she says, now go into your dad. So he goes in there and he says, dad, here I am with the blessing. He says, whoa, that was quick, says Isaac. How come so quick? Oh, God brought it to me. See what's going on here. Now he lies and brings God into this thing. And then, and then he says, boy, 
He says, that was very quick. But you, you, you sound like Jacob. You don't sound like Esau, the oldest. But come over here. Come over here. So he comes over and he feels him. Wow. He says, sounds like Jacob, but it feels like Esau. It must be Esau. Okay, let's have the blessing. So he blesses the younger of the two boys and gives him the birthright blessing. And then Jacob leaves the tent and he's hardly gone out when guess who comes along? The older brother with his stew that he's cooked up from the animal he's killed. And he says, Dad, here I am, ready for the blessing. What do you mean, ready for the blessing? I've already given it. And then they both realize they had been cheated. The older brother, he realized his brother had sneaked on him and stolen his blessing. So he says, just bless me. Sorry, I can't bless it. Watch, I've given it away. I don't take it back. Sorry, my boy, it's over. You can imagine what Esau felt. He went out of that tent and he said, when my dad dies, my brother Jacob is dead meat. I'm going to kill him. I am going to kill him for that. Because now he got a double portion and he's the head and not me. So I'm going to kill him for that. Well, fortunately, mum overheard that. And she said to Jacob, hey, my boy, I think you better run away from here because your brother's going to kill you when your dad dies. So she concocted a story. She says to Isaac, the husband, she says, listen, our boy Jacob, you know, he's now got the birthright blessing and he needs to marry a good lady. So I think we ought to send him away up towards North Syria. And so dad sends him away and he never sees his mum again. Now, you can imagine how this boy felt when he left just a few days later. He lay down to sleep, the Bible says. You imagine how discouraged he was. Think about this for a minute. I've lied to my dad. I brought God into this. I've stolen from my own brother. What a, what a pathetic guy this fellow was when you think about it. I mean, could you get anybody more crooked than Jacob? But you imagine how he must have felt forsaken of God so he lays down lies down to sleep the Bible says takes a pillow of stones and that night God speaks to him he has a dream he dreams of a ladder that reaches all the way from earth to heaven it's a staircase much like we see in this place in Chichen Itza in Mexico these were staircases to the gods and this is the sort of thing they had back in Palestine, in, in near the Mesopotamia. We call them ziggurats, staircases to the gods. So he must have dreamt something like this, not a ladder like we think of, a, you know, that we climb the fence with or something, like this sort of thing. And he dreamt that the angels were going up and down on the ladder. And then a voice spoke to him from the top of the ladder. It was God. And notice what God said. And behold, the Lord stood above it. And said, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Now that's grace, isn't it? What did this guy deserve really? A bullet to the head maybe? <laughs> Think about it. He's a crook. Yet God loved him. And I want to say tonight, my friends, tonight, you can never go so far beyond God that he can't reach you. You may have done something even worse than Jacob, but I doubt it. And even if you have, let me tell you, God loves you. God has a plan for your life. He has a reason for your existence and he has a hope for the future. And Jacob was talked to by God. How gracious is God? Well, Jesus picked up this story and he showed us what it really meant. When he was talking to his followers, Nathaniel, he said these words, Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. In other words, that ladder, that's me. That staircase, that's me. 
That staircase that Jacob saw, really that's me. I'm the way from, from earth to heaven. I'm the way to the heart of God. That's why Jesus said these words, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So my friend tonight, if you've wandered from God, if you've done something terrible that you're ashamed of, let me tell you, God is the same for you as he was with Jacob. He loves you dearly and he forgives you when we throw ourselves on him. That's the great story. Well, you can imagine when Jacob woke up, he was just over the moon, as we say. He was just amazed that God would be so gracious to him. He could see that he was cared for by God. And that's the truth for today. By Jesus, God cares for all your needs. Remember, the voice said, I'm going to look after you. I'm going to put a shirt on your back. I'm going to put clothes on you. I'm going to look after you. I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. I'm with you, Jacob even though you've done terrible things. What a beautiful God we have. So notice this response of Jacob to this. If God will be with me, what he's saying, since God is going to do all this for me, that's what he's really saying, and going to keep me and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, then the Lord shall be my God. Who oh, wouldn't want a God like that? And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you, says Jacob. Now that's an interesting reaction, isn't it? I'm going to give you a tenth of everything I own. Now, this is actually in the Bible called the tithe, a tenth. And Jacob was going to give this in response to the mighty grace of God in his life because of what God had done for him. He was so happy. Now, as we said, this is mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. In fact, his grandfather, Abraham, also returned tithe or the tenth. He went out on a big battle with 300 men and, and, and defeated a whole army of people from Mesopotamia to rescue his nephew Lot and the king of Sodom and all their people that were taken away. And when he got all the loot, look what it says. And he, Abraham, gave him a tithe of all. He said, a tenth of what I've, what I've collected from the enemy, I'm going to give to God. So this is not a new principle. Now let's talk about this tithe for a moment because we're going to see this is actually given by God to boost our faith, especially in the end times as well. All the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It's holy to the Lord. So the tenth is specifically said to be, this is God's. This belongs to God. He calls the shots as to how it's used. Tithe supports gospel workers, we notice in the Bible. Let's notice this principle is picked up in the book of Leviticus. Now, you remember the temple. The temple was looked after by a group of people called the Levites. There were 12 tribes in Israel. 11 of them had lots of land to grow crops or to raise livestock. And they, that's how they earned their living and fed their families and so on. But one tribe had not so much. And that was Levi because their duty was to look after the temple, the spiritual interests of the whole nation. So they didn't have so much. So this is what he's talking about. Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform. What work did they do? The work of the tabernacle or the sanctuary or the temple of meeting. So how would these people survive when all their time was spent looking after the temple and the services for the whole nation? Well, the tenth would come to them. Now, Paul picks this up in the New Testament. He says the same principle applies in the Christian church. He says, do you not know? And he's referring back to what we just read. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple? And those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? Even so, the Lord has commanded. In other words, the Lord didn't suggest this. The Lord commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. So those who are sharing and looking after the spiritual interest, they should live of the gospel because that's their they're, the whole time is spent that way. Now, what's interesting is the gospel workers or the priests in the Old Testament, the gospel workers in the New Testament time, they also return tithe. This was a principle. Notice what it says. And the priest, the descendant of Aaron, that's the Levite priest, shall be with the Levites. When the Levites receive the tithes from all of Israel, the Levites shall bring up a tenth of the tithes to the house of our God, to the rooms of the storehouse. So it's all equal wasn't like the priest or the ministers collected everything. No, they too returned a tenth, so they did the same 
as the people. That's a fair system. I wish the government would do this, you know. You know, some of you people who have the ability to, to make money, you know, you might be a business person. The more you earn, the more the government takes. The percentage is greater. They ought to read the Bible, I reckon. Just joking. <laughs> All right. What a tragedy that people in many churches have bingo for Jesus. You know what I mean? There are many churches that decide to support their pastor or their priest by doing raffles and a whole range of stuff. Church fates. That's a, the Bible says we don't need to do that. There's a very simple system to care for those who do this work. Just follow the principle of God. We don't need bingo for Jesus. Now, Jesus believed in returning God's tithe. And that's why I believe this is an important principle because we are followers of Jesus. Notice what happens. He's talking to the leaders of the nation of Israel, the spiritual leaders. And he says, you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. So they'd get 10 little tiny seeds and they'd take one out for God because one tenth, you see, give that to God. Very particular. You pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and you have neglected the weightier matters of the law. What are those? Justice and mercy and faith. They're the, they're the more important issues. But notice what he says. These you ought to have done. Now, in other words, mercy and justice and faith without leaving the others undone. Do both, says Jesus. Do both. Return your tithe, but be merciful and have justice and, and faith. So Jesus believed in this principle. Now, there's a blessing in giving. And this is what I want, to, want you to see tonight, because this is how we're going to discover the keys to financial success. Financial survival. Number one, the first blessing is financial. Notice what it says. Financial security, in fact. God is talking to the Israelites, just like the Israelites turned away from the Sabbath and disobeyed. Just like they turned away from the, 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 the instructions on what you should eat and what you should not eat. So they turned away from the tithe thing. And so God is talking to them. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. That's the temple. That there may be food in my house. The temple and try me test me now in this says the Lord of hosts if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it could you believe how good God is there I'm going to open the windows of heaven and I'm going to pour out blessings upon you now that doesn't mean God's going to make us millionaires or something simply means he's going to look after us and care for us in a big way. Now, does it really work? Let me tell you, it surely does. Here's an example, first of all. All these guys, you've, you've, you've scrubbed your teeth with, with Colgate, I, I'm sure. You've probably had Heinz 78 varieties, whatever we're up to. And you might have had some Kraft cheese at some point in time, right? These, the people who originally started these companies all returned the tents to God. All of them. God bless them. Now, the guys who run them today, I'm sure they don't do the same thing. But the fellows who started these companies, this is what they did. My wife and I uh, were uh, students. I was a student up in Newcastle area. And uh, my wife, Meryl, and she was, um, she was the breadwinner. <laughs> she put the bread on the table while I studied the books. And uh, we used to, we like reading together. We like reading books together. And we're reading a, book, a story together of this solo mum who, um, you know, she's got about five children and she, she's supporting these kids on her own, no husband. And she comes to her minister, her pastor, and she says, Pastor, she says, listen, uh, you, know, you know this tithe thing, this tent thing? She says, uh, I can't afford it. And I'll show you why. And so she had a big list on a piece of paper and she said, rent, school fees, you know, food, da, 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 da. She had it all listed out. She said, Pastor, you add it up, there's none left for God. So can you give me a special dispensation on this tithe thing? <laughs> he, he said, well, 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 I'd like to, but it's not my deal. I didn't ask that this is God's plan, not mine. So I can't tell you not to do what God tells us to do. She got really mad at him. She, she stomped her feet down, well, bust him. She said, I'll give him two tenths. He was really angry. And she went away. A few months later, she came back to the pastor and she said, you know, pastor, I, I, I'm amazed. She said, you know what? I'm better off today on 
eight tenths than I was on ten tenths. Now she 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 she, she was a lady of a word. She she said she's going to do it, so she actually did it. I mean, she doesn't have to give two tenths. God says one, but she, she carried through on her, her, her statement. Anyway, she said, I got a new job and this and this and this and this. And see, Pastor, I'm better off now than I was before. And my wife and I were, 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 were reading that and we, we looked at each other. We were already giving a tenth, but we thought we should give more offerings to God because we, he's looked after us. So we gave more as a result of reading that story. And then we get two checks in the mail. First one was for me for a scholarship that I didn't even know existed. I never applied for it, never knew about it, but here comes a check that I gave me a scholarship. The second one was my wife said around this time, she said, listen, sweetheart, I'm carrying our first child. Uh, she's, she's pregnant. Uh, she says, uh, I'm tired. Can I quit? I mean, what do you say to your wife when she's putting bread on the table? You say, no, you can't quit. I said, no. We've got six months left. We'll make it through. Yeah, yeah you, you quit. You're doing a great job. <laughs> so she said, but, but, but you need to know something. She said, I've been working for this company for nine years. And if I quit, we're going to miss the bonus of $1,000. Now, that's a good lot of money for students back then. She said, so we're going to forfeit that if I quit. I said, don't worry. What else can you say? Don't worry about it. Well, we get a letter in, we get a, we get a check in the mail from the employer. It says, uh, even though it's only nine years, we're going to give you the bonus. Man, you know what that did to us? This stuff works. And I could spend more, I guess if we ask people to share, I'm sure there's many people who could tell stories like this. I could tell you a beauty, but I better not, because we better move on, that came from our own life just a few weeks ago. Unbelievable. When we're faithful to God, he's faithful to us. He'll look after us. Doesn't mean to say he'll give us, a, as we said, a million dollars, but he's going to look after us, that's for sure. Number two point, not only is it do we help financially, but there are blessings in that it increases our faith. Jesus said, or Paul said, I should say, we live by faith and not by sight. When you and I have to step out and do something that God asks us to do, but we can't see how we could do it, let me tell you what's going to happen. When you see God work, your faith is going to soar. You are going to be stronger in your faith. That's why God said these words, bring all the tithes, test me. You try me. You see if I don't come through. That's God saying, you test me. Test me now by doing this. Just do it. And you see what I do, says the Lord of hosts. And see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven. Hear God's word and act on it. That's faith. I hear what he says. Even if I don't want to do it, I'm going to do it because God says so. This is faith. Trust me, says God. Put me to the test. Number three, it promotes generosity and starves our selfishness. By nature, pretty much all of us are selfish. We're hoarders. We want stuff. We, we, we find that, you know, that's by nature. And when we participate in this, it starves our selfishness. The Bible says, remember the words of the Lord Jesus, says Paul, that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. That's what the Bible is saying. It helps us more than it helps the people we're helping. It helps us to be more generous. In fact, Jesus met a young fellow one day. I want you to notice what happened. This guy was a rich young fellow and he came to Jesus and he said, Lord, he said, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, keep the commandments. He said, I'll do more, but I lack something. He could see something was missing in his own life. He said, I keep all the commandments, on the outward anyway, but I'm missing something. So Jesus said to him these words. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. I like that. He loved this young fellow and said to him, one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have and give it to the poor. Now, what was the thing he lacked? Which commandment did he not keep? Number one, his money was his God. Jesus could see that. You shall have no other gods. And for him, money was his God. So Jesus said, hey, this is your God. Give it away. Sell all you have. Give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up your cross and follow me. He could have been one of the apostles. That's what it's telling us. He could have been Peter. Or at least next to Peter, you know, one of his followers. And follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. 
What a tragedy. This man is not going to have eternal life because he thought money is more important than God. What a, why would we do that? But this man did. Tragic. Now, God's not asking all of us to sell all we have and give to the poor. But he is asking us to return our tithe, to give offerings, whatever that is. That's up to us. And that's what he's saying. Is, is our money our God or is God our God? It promotes a generous spirit. That man could have done what Jesus said and he'd have been a different person. Number four, it's partnering with, partnering with God in saving people. That's what happens when we get involved in this thing. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, said Paul, that though he was rich, was Jesus rich? Yes, he owns everything out there in space and down here. Everything. He was wealthy. Bill Gates, you are a pauper compared to God, right? It's true. It's true. Though he was rich for your sake, put your name in that, for your sakes he became poor. Why? So that through his poverty, you and I might become rich, rich in the real things that count, rich in eternal life, rich in love, genuine love, rich in all sorts of things. That's why Jesus came. And when we join him, we're partnering with him in saving souls because that's what he did all that for. Partnering with God, we're investing in the lives of people for eternity. What a privilege. Now, returning God's tithe is actually a moral issue. Uh, Malachi picked this up again when he's talking to the Israelites. Notice what he said. God is talking. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, where have we robbed you? God, we didn't steal, even steal money from you, God. That's what they're saying. Yes, you have, said God. In tithes and in offerings, you are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. You see, by not returning God's tithe, by holding on to it, that which was his, they were stealing from God. And that's what God said. So this becomes a moral issue for us. There was a guy who was confronted with this issue in the time of Jesus. He was a rich fellow and he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and I'll build greater ones. And there I will store all my crops and more my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid out for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, fool. Oh, that's a strong word, isn't it? Why was he a fool? This night, tonight, while you're making all these big plans, your soul will be required of you. You're going to die. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Wow, solemn words, aren't they? My friends, what God is trying to tell us is he's going to look after us. When we return to him what belongs to him, he, we will not suffer. He will look after us. He will care for us. He will make sure. What profit, Jesus said, is it to a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Good questions, aren't they? So Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where is our treasure? Is it on God? Is that where we're focused? Our treasure will be where our heart is. We will do what God says because we have a heart for him. Now, bank your treasure in heaven, God says. Now, let's just talk quickly about how you calculate the tithe. It's not rocket science, is it? So if my weekly income is $500, how much am I going to give to God? Wow, that's amazing maths, isn't it? Pretty simple. $50. And parents, let me tell you something. Teach your kids this while they're little kids. So when you give them $10 or $5, whatever it is, help them say, well, how much should I give to, to, back to God? $1 if I give them 10 you know? Teach them that. They will love that, to grow up that way, thinking this is, what, this is natural part of my life. So it's a beautiful thing, the Bible says. So tithe, one-tenth. Offerings, that's up to us. God doesn't tell us how much offerings. That's it, dependent on what you, if you, you have different needs, if you think, wow, God's blessed me, you can get, that's, that's entirely up to us. God says, but the tenth, that's what he tells us, that goes to him. 
Now, here's the keys to financial security as we wrap this up. Number one, remember we must trust in God. Rest in his care. Let's not worry. Verse one. Number two, make God our first priority in life. Great principle for financial security. Put him first. God will look after the other stuff. Number three, remember God owns it all. All I am is a manager. That's all I am. I'm not an owner. I'm a manager. Takes the worry out of it. I'm looking after stuff that doesn't belong to me. Do a good job, of course. Number five, return God's tithe and offerings. Those are the five keys for security, financial security. If you and I put those into practice, let me tell you, you will be a happy person. I can assure you. We put God first and so on. I like the way Dottie Rambo put it in one of her songs. She says, the things that we love and hold dear to our hearts are just borrowed. They're not ours at all. Jesus only lets us use them to brighten our lives. So remind us, remind us, dear Lord. Good words, aren't they? Remind us, Lord, we are just stewards. Remind us that that's all we are. And so in the end of time, economics will be used to enforce global worship. The devil knows where to hit, let me tell you. The back pocket or your handbag, wherever your purse is, wherever your credit cards are. He knows where to hit. This is going to be one of his issues. Another one is going to be physical coercion, we learnt. A third one is going to be signs and wonders, miracles to suck us in. Some people are drawn by different things. Well, this is an area. Economics to enforce global worship. And the guy who's going to, in, to push this is going to be the second beast, the one from, the, from the, the land. Protestant United States of America that's no longer following God. This is going to be the key instigator to push the mark of the beast. And he's going to do it through economics. He, the land beast, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. That day is coming when none of us will be able to buy or sell unless we take the mark. If we take the mark, we will be able to buy or sell. But we won't want the mark because it's against God. Most people, sadly, money or their employment or whatever it is will be more important than God, says John. All the world marvels and follow the beast. So most people, money is going to be more important than God. The only ones who it won't be are those who have learned. Remember that text, all the world marvels. The ones who won't are those who have learned absolute trust in God. And where did they get their absolute trust? In the daily matters like what we've just talked about. They have learned to trust in God. When God says to them, keep my Sabbath. How can I keep your Sabbath when I've got to, work, got to go to work? Just, just do what I say, says God. Okay, I'll trust you. I'll do it. Return your tithe. How can I return my tithe? I don't have enough money. Just do it, says God. You watch what I'll do. When we trust God today, we are learning how to fight the dragon in the end of time. We will never go against the beast unless we've learned trust now. I can assure you of that. And that's why God do, does these things to help us build our trust up. I like the story that happened. A, f a house was being destroyed, demolished by a fire. And the family were gathered on the front lawn. And the parents were counting up the kids and they realized one's missing. Where is she? And then she appeared in one of the windows with a fire behind her. She was standing at the, at the, at the window and she couldn't see anything because of the smoke and, uh, you know, dark outside and so on. And, and her dad was down below and he said, he said, Susan, jump. She said, Daddy, I can't see you. You don't have to see me. Jump, Susan, Daddy will catch you. But I can't see. Don't worry, just jump. So that little girl just sailed on out there and her daddy caught her. And that's like the tithing thing is. Sometimes we don't think, how could we possibly do this? God says, just do it. You watch what I'll do. I'll catch you. I'll look after you. And my friends, when we do these things, God is building our faith for the big issues that are coming up. Let's pray together. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you that some of the things that seem so hard 
are actually a blessing in disguise for us. You're trying to starve our selfish hearts. You're trying to build our faith up. You're trying to help us to trust you in the easier times so that when the tough times come, we'll just keep trusting you like those great people in, in, in the Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Oh God, tonight we pray that you will help us. If you want to tell the Lord tonight, Lord, just help me to be faithful in this matter of the, of the tenth. I need your help. Just raise your hand tonight just to tell God, Lord, I need your help. I'm going to follow you in this thing, but Lord, I just need your help because of myself, I can't do this thing, but I'm going to do it because you say so. Lord, you see our hands raised tonight. Thank you that you're a faithful God. You proved that to, to Jacob. Thank you so much that you do it the same for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to Countdown Back to the Future, made available by the Victoria Park Seventh-day Adventist Church. For more resources like this, visit their YouTube page, Vic Park SDA Church. The Clark family will now sing, God Will Come Through. Looking in the mirror at my life and my plans Wondering how I'm gonna make it Wondering how I'm gonna stand Then I look at your goodness on my life and where I've been I've never been forsaken Lord, you've never failed me yet So when I feel like giving in Lord, remind me again When the mountain was in front of me You made the mountain move When the road ahead seemed too dark You guided me through When the waters were in front of me You parted them too there's never been a day in my life God didn't come through Standing where you are right now I know it seems there's no way out But I've been there, my friend this is not the end So when it feels like hope is gone And you feel you can't go on Just remember When there's a mountain in front of you He'll make the mountain move When the road ahead seems too dark He'll guide you through be a day in your life when God won't come through. He's bigger than the mountain. He's stronger than the storm. His love is like no other. You can run into His arms. When there's a mountain in front of you, He'll make the mountain move When the road ahead seems too dark He'll guide you through oh, When the waters are in front of you He'll part them too There's never been a day in your life Oh, they'll never
Betsy Butler and I want to welcome you to Healthy Living Around the World. I am on site at Centre for Health in Bulgaria and with me is Arthur Cavaglio. Welcome Arthur to the program. Thank you. Now Arthur, you're here at Centre for Health and I believe you're in the training school here, is that correct? Yes, yeah, that's correct. Uh, I am here in the school. I got here to receive some healthy training mm -hmm. and also some Bible studies. You're doing some Bible training as well as, yeah. as health training together yeah, in the yes, same place. Together. Interesting. Where are you from originally? I'm from Brazil. All the way from Brazil? Yes. So how did you find out about the school here? Because I'm living in Tunisia, you know, I'm taking part of a project from the, that's connected with the, one of the leaders here. And they do some training so we can, whatever you're doing in these countries, you know, around the world, we can serve people better, we can help people to find a better way of living, like a better health way of living. And uh, also for myself, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying too much here, I'm getting healthier here actually. Okay. Yes. yes. Uh, I have a, a little problem on my knees, you know, and I need to lose weight because of that. And since I got here, I, I think I, I lost some pounds. <laughs> ah, yes, okay, so you've one. noticed a difference. What kind of things are you learning about here that's helping you? We are uh, learning about um, like uh, the benefits of living the nature, you know, like uh -huh. close to trees and fresh air, yes. like uh, having a balanced diet, uh, not overeating, like eating what is sufficient for your body, mm -hmm. exercising, you know, the eight natural remedies of life. We're learning also the benefits of charcoal. Oh! Yeah, how we can use charcoal for medicine, so preventive medicine. Yes. All good stuff, garlic, you know, all these herbs that we have in nature. So how can we use them? Mm -hmm. And uh, to prevent a lot of diseases, actually, with charcoal we can do many, many things. We can use externally and internally and it helps like even your kidneys, I, I didn't know about that. Like, if you put externally, it, it can it can extract. It's the carb, car, the the charcoal is so strong that it can extract some toxins even from outside. When you use your skin to to take the toxins of your kidney, yeah. like wonderful stuff, wonderful stuff like that. We are learning, and mm. uh, we have healthy food here. Also, it's all vegan, and they know how to cook really delicious food <laughs> oh you're finding it tasty yes it's really delicious and uh, like it's, it's you don't find any lack of any supplements like any protein anything uh -huh. like all uh -huh. vitamins all balanced and that's of course because the food's so good sometimes I'm tempted to eat too much okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm getting better here I'm losing weight as I told you mm. and, um, yeah I think this is if you want to if you want to get a good health, I think this, is pla this place is a good place. Yeah, okay. So tell me, is it different how you're eating here? Is that different to how you were eating back in Brazil? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, normally in my house, um, like for example, we use a lot of oil, like for, we fry a lot of things, you know? Yes. And it's not healthy. Maybe we use a little bit too much spices. The bread, the bread here is amazing. It's like, I don't know how they do it, but they use a... They don't use like biological li li liver. Uh, yeast? Yeah, yeast, sorry. So what you mean, leaven? Yes, leaven, yeast. Yeah, leaven. They don't use yeast. Uh, I don't know how they do, but it's uh, it's whole wheat bread uh -huh. and they use this uh, natural... Is it like wheat. a culture that they use? Like I, I don't know, but it's not biological. It's like oh. from, the, from, the, from the fruits. Oh. I don't know how they do. Okay, but obviously you're enjoying it. So. Yeah, it's so good. So in, in we are we have to learn. Actually, gonna learn this and how to cook the bread and everything, so we can do at home also. But at home we don't do that, you know. Oh. And uh, yeah, like it's it's really helpful when you learn to to bake a good bread. Mm -hmm. Wow! So you're learning such a large variety of practical things that are helpful yes. in your home. Mm -hmm. So. Can you share maybe is there a health principle that you've adopted that's one of your favorites that you really enjoy? Well, the health principle I like is like the principle that everything's together connected. Like um, when you like your brain is connected with your organs, so everything that you eat affects your your brain. So it will affect eventually your studies, your religion. Yes. You know, like the way you connect. Like I, I believe in God. I pray. Mm. And, and when I when I take care of my health, it's better. So, and my my brain works faster. So I mm. feel more connection with God. And uh, 
I can study and learn better. When you sleep well, also, you know, when you sometimes you don't sleep well, you eat too much, your brain gets a bit tired, so you yes. get headache a bit, so mm -hmm. you cannot concentrate mm -hmm. for for many things. And especially when you pray, you like you you get distracted so much. And yes, and this is another principle. So it's holistic way of living. So you connect everything. You connect your your food with your with your study, spiritual and and physical. Right. So all, all those different el elements are all yes, interconnected. Yes, you, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's so interesting. You were mentioning that you finding it's having benefits for your spiritual life. Yes, for sure. You've noticed that. Well, you've been here. Yes, for mm. sure. Yeah, I can. I woke up more like uh, with more energy. Yes. So I can I can wake up and pray and talk with God. I'm not that sleepy, you yes, know. Yes, yes, yes. And then when I read my Bible. Mm -hmm. I can concentrate more. And when you walk also through the trees here, that this beautiful environment, you can also feel, you can hear the voice of God more clearly. You know, that's not so much mm. noisy. Mm. So you can mm -hmm. you can see the beauty of the. The creation of God and mm. how the law of God is in everything and how he gave us such a blessing with herbs and trees that things that heal us is good for our health. Yes, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. So that's, you, you've gotten so many, so many good benefits from all of this experience. Now tell me if you're going to say you meet someone who is talking about their lifestyle and, and they're thinking that they want to improve it. Mm -hmm. Um, in some ways, what would you what would you say to them? How how would you recommend they go about starting to improve their lifestyle? Well, I mean, I think it depends. I would try to know the person better and know what their needs. But if you need to summarize in a short sentence, I would say that maybe preventing stuff like uh, take care of the things you eat mm -hmm. for sure, mm -hmm. because you are what you eat, mm. and try to live closer to the nature i would say okay the environment is really important so the the things we have in big cities today is it's not so so good for your health in many ways mm -hmm. yeah. so, so go to a place where they can spend more time in a natural environment yes. surroundings and that will be yeah, a benefit possible, to them yes yes of course take care of the, of the food yes because yeah. we will affect in every other aspect of your life Yes. Yeah, it has a powerful influence, doesn't it? Wow, well, thank you so much for sharing your experience You're with welcome. us here. My pleasure. It's, um, it's always inspiring to hear how people have benefited from the wonderful healthy living principles, which, as you explained so well, God has given us a, out of his love for us. Yes. So that's, um, that's really inspiring to hear. Our guest today has been Arthur Carvalho, and uh, he is here at the Center for Health Training School here in Bulgaria. Thank you for tuning in to Healthy Living Around the World. I am your host, Casey Butler, and until next time, God bless. You've been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio.